Hi, this is Mrs. Brown from Research Triangle High School. The purpose of this presentation is to give you an introduction and an overview to the Shakespearean tragedy, Hamlet. Now the first thing I want to talk about a little bit is the overall structure of a Shakespearean tragedy, and it, this certainly will apply to the play Hamlet. Now Shakespeare and most other Elizabethan dramas would have, been, would have been written in five acts, and these acts are going to follow a very predictable pattern, and you may recognize this pattern from other short stories and novels that we've studied as well. Now we start off with Act 1. Now sometimes we get a little bit of exposition where they tell us a little bit about who these people are and what's happening, but usually something happens at the beginning of Act 1. And this is known as the inciting force. And this is usually something that in some way disturbs or overthrows the natural order of the universe. Things aren't going the way that anyone expects them to go anymore. Something happens. And we usually in Act 1 will also meet our protagonist. And that is the person that would pro meeting for that the audience is going to be most empathetic with. It's sometimes known as the hero or the good guy, but as you'll see with Shakespeare that the protagonist may actually be quite flawed in a number of ways. And that person that we're watching, this protagonist, uh, begins to act against the antagonist. And the antagonist's kind of simple definition is the villain or the bad guy, but it's really the person who's the most opposing force against the protagonist. So if you think about the story Harry Potter, for example, over here, we have obviously Harry is kind of our good guy with the opposing force of Voldemort. And at the very beginning, something happens. In Harry's case, he gets this letter from Hogwarts and has this big realization that he's going to belong to this wizarding community. So there's usually something that happens that in some way overthrows or disturbs the way that you would have expected things to go. And then the protagonist and antagonist are set up to start acting against each other for the rest of the play. In Act 2 and 3, we're in the middle of the play, and we see the protagonist usually doing all kinds of stuff, making all these plans, taking all these actions to try to defeat the antagonist, and for much of the play actually seems to be winning. This is known as the rising action. This is where the conflict's kind of heating up, and we really see the protagonist working. Now, some place in Act 3, usually late in Act 3 or occasionally early in Act 4, but usually in Act 3, we come to what's known as the turning point or the climax of the play. This is kind of the highest point of action. And usually at this moment, the protagonist does something. It may make a choice or takes a, makes a decision or does an action of some kind that kind of seals the protagonist's fate. And this action is going to be something that the protagonist can't take back and can't turn back from and will help determine what the actual outcome of the events will be. And usually at this point now, because of this turning point, things begin to work against our protagonist and the antagonist begins to get the, the upper hand and seems to be in control and winning at this point. And this is known as the falling action of the play. So in Act 5, our final act, we come to the final confrontation between the antagonist and the protagonist. This is sometimes also referred to as the denouement, which is a French word which literally means the unraveling or the untying. And at this point, it, there's usually a moment in the Shakespearean plays where it looks like the protagonist might be able to avoid his fate. That things are like this last minute chance to get things to work, but then the resolution of the conclusion is usually the downfall of the protagonist in a tragedy, usually through the protagonist's death. But at the end, the protagonist often makes a speech about what they've learned, and by the end of the play, order and balance is restored. So remember, we started Act 1 with something that, that put the universe out of order, and usually by the end of the play in a Shakespearean tragedy, uni the universe will be restored to order again, usually because the hero has had to die. I want to just briefly go over some of the key characters that you're going to meet in Hamlet. First, we have our title character of Hamlet. He is the Prince of Denmark. His father's the king, in other words. Uh, and he's actually been away studying at the university in Germany. And he comes back for his father's funeral. So his father is older, his father has died, and at the opening of the play, Hamlet has returned for the funeral. 
we meet Queen Gertrude. This is Hamlet's mother, and she's actually quite young as a mother, and there's a lot of talk in the play about how she was probably a very young teenager who married the older king. So his father was much older, and the, the mother was much younger. And we find out that Gertrude has just gotten married again, even though Hamlet's father has just died. And the person she's married to? King Claudius, the new king. This is Hamlet's uncle, and he's the one who succeeds to, succeeds to the throne after Hamlet's uh, father dies. And this is Hamlet's dad's younger brother. So he's actually a little closer in age to Gertrude anyway. Now Hamlet's daddy may have died, but he still makes an appearance in the play as a ghost. And you're going to watch for this because he comes up more than once. And this ghost is going to come back with a message. There's something that he has to tell Hamlet. And it's going to be part of this inciting incident, the fact that the ghost of the king is not resting at peace, but is actually wandering around as part of that natural order being upset. We'll also meet Polonius. He's the chief advisor to the new king, kind of the guy who... Um, is the, the, the Lord Chancellor. He hangs around the court all the time and is always talking to himself. He's kind of a windbag. He loves to make these long, long speeches. And then he has his own little family. He has a son, Laertes, who's about Hamlet's age. And like the way that Hamlet's been away at college, Laertes has also been away studying. He's been in France. And he's also come back for the funeral of the king. And then we meet Ophelia. Ophelia is Polonius's daughter. So she and Laertes are brother and sister. And this is Hamlet's on again, off again girlfriend. Um, it's pretty clear that they had a thing going, but Hamlet's been away and now he's back. And a big question of the play is just exactly how serious is Hamlet actually about Ophelia. And then we also have Horatio. And Horatio is Hamlet's best friend. And he's kind of Hamlet's wingman and his confidant and hangs out with him. And Hamlet um, tells a lot of his ideas and feelings and thoughts to Horatio where he doesn't confide in um, any of the other characters. Now, there's a host of other characters you'll meet. Don't worry about knowing all of them now. This will, video will be here for you to come back and refer to as we meet them. Uh, first of all, there's Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. These are two buddies of college, uh, two college buddies of Hamlet's. Uh, they get called in to come back and help cheer him up, so to speak. We'll watch for exactly what they're really doing there at Elsinore. We meet Osric. He's one of the members of the court. He makes a lot of announcements and is, is around a lot of the time. There's Bernardo and Francisco. They're two of the guards at the castle. They're the first people to talk about the ghost. There's two grave diggers who were also referred to as clowns. Now, Shakespeare often meant clowns in this case to be sort of the lower class characters who often provided some comic relief, but not the way we think about clowns with funny red noses and big wigs and that kind of thing. And then there's Fortinbras. And Fortinbras is an interesting character because we hear about him throughout the whole play, but we don't meet him until the very end. And throughout the whole play, he's the prince of Norway, this neighbor to Denmark, and he is marching to war against Denmark from the very first act all the way through to the end. So an interesting character that kind of has some influence on it, but that we don't actually see until the very end. Now, the play Hamlet takes place in Denmark, in and around Elsinore Castle, which would have been this huge fortress right on the ocean. So you have this, this imposing medieval castle. And it's set in kind of the late medieval period. Shakespeare's a little vague about exactly when this is, probably 14th or 15th century. There's a couple of things that will help you understand the play better if you understand a little bit about some of the religious beliefs of Shakespeare's time and that Shakespeare sort of imposed on these characters from um, Denmark during this medieval period. First of all, there was this idea about death and confession. The idea was that if you died and you had not made a final confession, it meant that you died still in a sinful state. You had not had a chance to confess your sins and be forgiven, so you couldn't go directly to heaven because you still were in a sinful state. Instead, you would go to a place called Purgatory. Now, Purgatory was a place of punishment and waiting, and it was this long period of time where you'd kind of be stuck between earth and uh, between heaven and hell until you could somehow absolve yourself of whatever sins that you'd had in life. Now, if you killed yourself then, you would go straight to hell because there's no way to make a last confession if you're the last person who is doing something to yourself to kill yourself, right? So there's no way to stop and sort of confess if the, then the next thing you do is a sin of murder of yourself. So suicide was kind of a, a bad thing. It wasn't anything that was considered like an honor killing or anything noble because a suicide would not have any hope of heaven. 
And suicides, for that reason, could not be buried in holy grounds. You could not be buried in the churchyard if it was proven that you killed yourself. And then there's another thought. We have this um, modern concept of incest, is when you have some sort of romantic relationship with people that you were a blood relation to. But in Shakespeare's time, and by um, extension, again, this time in Denmark, incest would be anyone that you would relate it to by marriage. So let's say you had a brother and a sister-in-law who were not connected to each other, but they'd formerly been married to a pair of siblings, those two, if they got together, would be considered incest. So if you were related even by the legal contract of marriage, but no blood relationship, and you had any kind of a romantic relationship, it would still be considered incest. So those are some things that will help you understand why the characters are behaving and reacting the way that they are in a way that we might not be quite so um, worried about in a more modern sense. And lastly, there's a couple of motifs and patterns I want you to watch out for. So as you're reading the whole thing, you're going to be looking for these images. The first is this idea of poison. And they mention this a lot. They talk about poisoning people's feelings. And there's some literal poison in the play as well. The second is this idea of sickness and by extension, again, decay. The idea that something that used to be beautiful is now kind of rotting away and older. And you'll see a lot of those images throughout as the characters are talking. They'll, they'll speak using those kinds of tones. There's a big question in images of insanity and madness, that kind of interchangeable idea of how can you tell when someone is normal and how can you tell what kind of behavior means they've actually kind of lost it and have become insane. There's a ton of references to disguises in some way, and this is the whole spectrum of disguise. This is everything from just literally wearing a mask, a physical mask you put on, to a, per, um, a more metaphorical mask, the way that we hide our true feelings. And that goes along with the idea of acting. There's a lot of references to acting. There's actually a play within the play where these actors come to visit. And a lot of things like hiding or lying in some way, this idea of deception and that you can't quite tell what's real and what's not real, which brings us to this final motif of illusion versus reality. How do you know the difference between the two? And those are things that Hamlet's going to struggle with and that you're going to have a chance to watch throughout the whole play. So there's a few basics to get you launched on our study of Hamlet. We're going to be taking a look at Act 1 very soon. That's it. Good night.